Well, they have a whole bunch. Like you just Google what's the national day today and you'll see all of them, like strawberry day, rhubarb day. Church music director day. <laughs> That's every day now, Kevin. Of course it is. Right. Welcome to another episode of This Thing Called Church. Today is Wednesday, July 7th, and this is episode number five. Um, how are you guys? How are David and Kevin doing today? Great. Doing well. Did you um, do anything over Fourth of July weekend? <laughs> Me? Yeah, yeah, David, you had a, a whole bunch of things going on. Or oh, creatures. Well, I, all our kids were home. That was fun. Um, we hung out with some friends, preached on Sunday. But you uh, had animals in your house. You had like a little zoo. Oh, gosh, what you told yes. Us. Yes. Salem, Salem and McCann, our daughter and son-in-law, they have two almost 100-pound German shepherds. They were home. And um, somehow we ended up with a cat. Abby got a kitten. So we had to keep the uh, German shepherds from snacking on the kitten. <laughs> The kitten lived upstairs, and uh, the German Shepherds lived downstairs. Nice. Yeah. So Abby still lives with you? At, well, Abby's in Boone, but she's not in her – she's in a different – look. she's living somewhere else right now where she can't have a pet, but mm -hmm. she can have a pet after August 1st because she's moving. Okay. So we are watching the cat. Foster cat? Kitten, kitten is a tiny little kitten. It can't be more than six or seven weeks old. Um and um till august the first when the kitten will go live somewhere else <laughs> and then you'll have to get a kitten because you've gotten used no, to no no we are not getting a pet we're gonna <laughs> en enjoy being petless for a while kevin did you do anything exciting yeah we I had our, our neighbor yeah our neighbor has neighborhood has like a little party so we had about four or five Houses, we do like a little potluck, which was interesting because we haven't done that for a year and a half. So it felt yeah. a little weird, but, um, and then our neighbors like to go to South Carolina and get fireworks. So it's always like a exciting, someone's going to get arrested or hurt kind of a moment, but everything, I think it went okay. And then of course we had Monday off. So today feels like Tuesday to me because yeah, yesterday felt like Monday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm all out of sorts with the time. Yeah. How about you, Karen? <clears throat> we went to um, Tybee Island in Georgia. We go every every Fourth of July holiday with my cousin and her family. We always rent a house and have a fun time down there. And last year they didn't have fireworks, so this year they do. They do them on the beach, off the pier, so everyone just goes down on the beach and watches, which is really nice. And you know, it's a lot of work for 15 minutes, but you know. <laughs> That's the way David feels about his preaching every Sunday. So. It is. <laughs> it is a lot of work for 15 minutes. Um, so true. We can, we can edit that out if we need to. I guess. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. So it was nice. And and that's that's really, I mean, uneventful is the best kind of weekend to have. Um, so, Kevin, did you um hear about Richard Branson so he's going he's the first one to do commercial space flight and he's launching on July 11th which is on Sunday and it's it's not a rocket like that gets launched from a launch pad it's have you seen it it's like this plane, like a plane? <clears throat> it's a double double wing plane thing and his little rocket thing is in the middle so the big plane takes off with the little plane and then they get to a certain place and then Richard like launches himself from there and goes into space. And so it's, um, he's like beyond excited. And um, the FAA has approved for him to do commercial space trips starting next year for $250,000. They already have 700 people signed up including Tom Hanks, Justin Bieber, and Lady Gaga. 
All, all on the same plane? <laughs> what would we do? That would be like the day the music died all over again, right? No. When that plane crashed. Uh, you know, so, this is just an expense, expensive version of the redneck who strapped a rocket to his car and launched himself into the side of a mountain. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's same thing. It's just yeah. rednecks with money. Exactly. And then the other guy is going Nothing up. against rednecks, by the way. I mean, it's just, it just is. There, yeah. It's proof that rednecks are everywhere. <laughs> In every walk of life, every social status, it's just <laughs> true. I feel like we're going to have to, like, print a retraction for David later. No. About rednecks. So I just remember Jeff Foxworthy talking about going to a bowling alley one time that had valet service. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, right? It's just... Nothing wrong with being a redneck. Just no. um, <laughs> cultural phenomena. Yeah. But Bezos hey, got, is going too, right? The Amazon got a, dude? At a quarter of a million bucks, you can go to space. Yep. Bezos is going on the 20th. And apparently Bezos announced his launch first. Uh, and then Branson said, well, I'm going on the 11th. But when somebody asked Branson, like, are you guys competing? He's like, oh, no, of course not. But. You know, mm -hmm. but Bezos looks like a real rocket ship. And I don't know if he's really opening his program up for commercial like Branson is. So I don't know if, you know, I don't, they, he didn't say how long he was going for. I don't know if it's just like two times around and then you come back down. Like, I don't know, like. Like a space Uber. <laughs> Okay. All right. Really anyway, David, hold yeah. on, David. <clears throat> if we raise the money, would you go on one of those? No, oh, God, no. I'm not okay. getting on any. No, I don't. Okay. I'm not even a huge fan of flying. I do it okay. because I want to go to cool places, and it's really the only way to get to some of them. Um, you know, it doesn't take you like six months in the in the hold of a cargo ship or something. But um, you wouldn't go to Mars, I guess. Not going to Mars. No. But have at it. Hey, if it's your thing, I'm not opposed to it. I'd do it. I wouldn't. I'd do it. You would, Kevin? Absolutely. Okay. I love flying. Okay. I don't like flying because I'm not driving. Oh. You know, you. It's a, um, it's a control thing. <clears throat> like I, you know, like I would be equipped to actually fly the plane. Right. That, that's the lunacy in my logic. <laughs> is that somehow I would be better at it than the highly trained professional who's sitting up there actually doing it. But hey, we said this was rational. Well, when I first got, I thought I wanted to be a pilot, like a private pilot on my free time. But then I met Cindy and she didn't like me doing this. Went with a choir member. And we were about dating maybe two, three months. And she said, either me or the planes. And so I guess everybody knows where that ended up. So... <laughs> I'm not sure either one was cheaper than the other, but. Oh, that's funny. <clears throat> well, my brother yeah. and my father are both commercial airline pilots. My father's obviously retired by now, but my brother, like growing up, you know, he was younger than me. And, and we, you know, when you're growing up together with your siblings, you can't ever imagine them having a real job. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> we used to joke about, the day that you know you're on the plane with your family headed to Disney World, and you know my brother comes on the intercom and says, "Hi, I'm your captain." You know, but the, the reality is, it really happened. Um, he's a very good pilot. He's been flying for a very, very long time, and he's very good. But you know, it's still always question back then. So, um, okay. So our topic for today is that we were just talking about Methodism, being a Methodist. And Kevin and I were briefly talking and just saying, I was asking more like, well, what's the difference between some of these religions? And because I kind of, we kind of, I hate to say we fell into Methodism, but we kind of did. Um, and, and, I, and I don't know, I was trying to find a, demo, a study or a report that showed like what percent of people stay 
the same religion that they grew up in? What percent of people transfer? Or, you know, like I was trying to find some, some kind of numbers and I couldn't find anything. But I would say that most people, probably if you were raised one way, you stay in that religion. I don't know how many people actually shop religion. Um, but so for us, like we just were, we were looking for a church on Sunday at a particular time with a type of service. And we ended up at Davidson and we really liked it. And then we realized, oh, well, this is what Methodist is or Methodism. And then we've been learning as we've been attending, but it's not like we knew the book of discipline or any of the rules before we went to church first. And then when Kevin was talking, we were talking, I was like, well, what's the difference between this one and this one? Like, so what are some of the key differences and who, which religion are we closely related to? And what are some of the major differences between the, the key religions? Go for it, David. <laughs> you can pick anywhere to start because I just threw everything at you at once. And so yeah. you can just pick one section and grow, go from there. Right. Well, so if you put a, if you kind of imagine a spectrum of um, kind of a theological, ecclesiological doctrine of the church spectrum, and kind of on one end of the spectrum, you have sort of um, uh, radical reformation types like, um, you know, Mennonites, Anabaptists, um, uh, Amish, Puritans kind of on one end. And then on the other end, you have the more Catholic traditions. Roman Catholicism, um, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, and you kind of imagine that spectrum. Um, this is not this is not scientific, so please, um, you know, this this breaks down at a lot of different places. But just to kind of visualize it, Methodists would be somewhere on the um, uh, if and if this let's say in the center were uh, was a tradition like uh, the Presbyterian Church, kind of in the middle. And to the right, not 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 politically, but let's just say on one side of them, towards the the hardcore Protestant folks would be Baptists and and folks like that, kind of congregational traditions. Um, and then on the other side, the more Catholic end, we would be to the we'd be on that side of the spectrum. So we would be on the Catholic end of this, not all the way out there with Roman Catholics and and um, um, Orthodox. But if you back up from there a little bit, say maybe the next thing would be perhaps Anglicans and Episcopalians, and then a little closer to the center, maybe center, maybe Lutherans, um, and then a little closer in would be United Methodists, and then kind of Presbyterians in the middle, and then the more congregational um, Protestants, Baptists, um, uh, they'd be on that side. Now that breaks down at a lot of different points, but just kind of thinking about it. Um, we are closer theologically to um, Catholics than we are to Presbyterians and Baptists. Um, we're, we're closer theologically to um, Lutherans in some way. Um, and we're is theologically essentially the same as, um, as Anglicans and Episcopalians. Because John Wesley was an Anglican priest his entire life, uh, he never uh, never gave that up, and um, all of the the basic theological teachings of the Methodist Church are basically the theological positions of the Anglican Episcopal Church. Now we differ on how we organize the church, how folks become pastors or priests, what we believe on some social issues, but theologically, in other, in other words, how we understand God, how we understand the church, how we understand salvation we're basically episcopalian or anglican and this is uh, something i do it just after talking with karen I, I didn't realize this it makes sense but that the american methodist church predates the british methodist church yeah yeah because 1784. we started our own yeah because the methodist church in england was a, a subsect of the anglican church and so they split off from the anglican church later than because of the colony and the colonial revolution the american revolution yeah yeah after Makes wesley sense. died yes. yeah they because he was insistent upon the the methodist movement in england so methodism started as a reform movement to try to revive and revitalize the anglican church which he believed had gotten too 
it become too aristocratic, too out of touch with kind of day to day life. Um, and um, so it, Methodism was re it was really kind of a sort of a lay monastic movement to um, try to bring new vitality to the Anglican Church. He didn't want to be another denomination. He wanted to be a more vital Anglican. So um, it was only after his death that the Methodists split away in, in England. But 1784, we became the Methodist Episcopal Church in America. So right after the revolution. Um, and notice Methodist, because we have a method, kind of a discipline for life, and Episcopal, that is our form of government, um, governance. We have bishops. We have an Episcopal form of governance. So Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, and that, of course, makes us more like Catholics, Anglicans, having bishops. Mm -hmm. um, clergy, our clergy are appointed. They move around from church to church. They're appointed by the bishop. That makes us more like, in some ways, the Anglicans, Episcopalians, and Catholics. Um, so, yeah, um, I don't know, you know, um, so Charles was the, John was kind of the great organizer and the great preacher of our faith. Um, Charles was the wonderful hymn writer. I don't know, what, 6,000 hymns, something like that, Kevin? Oh, yeah. Um, and if, in, in many ways, if you want to learn Methodist theology, what we believe, just open the hymnal and find a Charles Wesley hymn. Yeah, I agree. Um, and there's lots of places online now you can just find all these old hymns that aren't even on a hymnal um, that have fallen out of favor for whatever reason. But there's so much great stuff out there. You can Google Charles Wesley hymns and, and read the original text without a tune. Um, and it really is a, a treatise, a, a theological, theological treatise. Yeah, you know, the, the basic, Karen, the basic place that we would differ, say, from Presbyterians or um, Baptists or some others is... Um, and these are, this is all an oversimplification. So, um, it's, there's a much, there's a much longer conversation that we could have about that, this, that we want today. But, um, for instance, say the doctrine of salvation, how is it that we are, how is it that God saves us? Um, you know, and, and for Methodists, it's a bit of a synergistic understanding that we cooperate. It's all by God's grace. God is the primary actor in our salvation. Um, it's all a gift, but we do, we, we do have to respond. Our response matters. And, um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a grace enabled response. And, um, we believe that, uh, God's at work in someone's life before they even know it. Mm -hmm. Um, that's provenient grace, kind of the grace that comes before an awareness, mm -hmm. um, that we, um, that, that, and that sort of stirs within us a desire to, to repent or to turn around to begin living life in a new direction um uh, an awareness you know wesley on at his alders gate experience that's where he 1738 he said you know i i trust that you know in christ and christ alone for my salvation that i too am saved by by grace um and and beyond justification you know being made right with god if you want to think about it that way um this is where methodism really kicks in uh, for some traditions, it's almost like that's kind of the end. Um, and every Sunday is trying to get people back to that point of justification, you know, coming back down the aisle. Um, for Methodists, that, that's the beginning. That, that's where the beginning of the fullness of life in Christ, or what we refer to as sanctification, being made holy, um, coming to have the heart and mind of Christ, being transformed being sanctified. What, for Wesley, uh, the way he talked about it is being made perfect in love. Didn't mean we didn't make mistakes, but it meant that we, we, God worked within us. We cooperated with what God wanted to do within us using the means of grace, prayer, scripture, fellowship, service, worship, sacraments, uh, leaning into those means of grace so that God slowly sort of reshapes us, remolds us, um, makes us a holy person, someone who loves the way Jesus loves. Um, and that, so I, I think that's one of the real beautiful things about the Methodist tradition. And then in that regard, makes us more Catholic uh, mm -hmm. with a small C. Um, <laughs> that, um, you know, we, um, God, God loves us as we are, but, but so much that God doesn't want to leave us as we are. 
Kevin, what were you saying? Which one were you telling me about yesterday? You said the big difference between us and somebody else was that you're going to hell without knowing you're going. Like, what did you, what was this? Do you remember what you said? Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, I think I was talking about uh, this idea of doctrine of predestination. That, that one. is more what we call Calvinistic or Reformed or Presbyterian. And again, there's nothing... I don't want to, like, if you were raised pre Cal, uh, Presbyterian, don't don't hear this as an indictment, but there's this idea of pre predestination that it's already decided who is going to heaven and who is not. And David, clear me up if I get off the, the what we re believe in, uh, unlimited atonement, uh, everyone can go to heaven, whereas I think more Calvinistic people would say limited atonement, that the three of us here, one of us is not going to go to heaven, it's already been decided, and there's nothing you can do. Fair enough, David? Yeah, that's that's pretty close. And it's it's all about protecting the sovereignty of God, because you do get into this, you know, that that it is God. And it, so Wesley believed this for sure, that it is God and God alone who can say has the power to save. Um, there is a kind of slippery slope a bit of when you start talking about cooperating with God, you can kind of slip over into a kind of works righteousness where if I'm good enough, I can make sure I'm getting in, right? That is not biblical. Um, that that's I can I can work my way, you know, uh, to, to salvation. Wesley, Calvin, um, the the broad tradition of the church would say no to that. No, if you could do that, there'd be no need for Jesus. Um, what was the heresy? The early heresy about that? It was I forget the guy's name who believed oh, Pelagius. That. Pelagius, yeah. yeah. Pelagianism, which is um, essentially the idea that. Um, well, I'll get it wrong, but it's it's essentially the idea that you you can earn, you have a role in earning your salvation, and so Calvin, the pres father of you know sort of Presbyterianism, would to try to protect God's sovereignty to say no, God saves, and drawing on a couple of passages of Scripture would say well then God elects certain people to salvation, and certain people to damnation, because God is sovereign, salvation is God's gift to give. And God can do with that gift whatever God chooses because God is sovereign. So the one thing that I've asked this before, and, and I think, so you guys, you go to seminary and it's kind of generic, right? It's not based on, I'm going to be a Methodist pastor or a Baptist or Presbyterian. Like you all go to one kind of everybody gets kind of the same seminary training and then maybe you specialize afterwards. Is that kind of how it works? Like to become a pastor? Um, well, an, so an MDiv is a three-year degree. It's a little bit like med school in that everybody, every medical doctor has had certain courses mm -hmm. that are all the same. Doesn't matter what your, what your, uh, you know, what your specialty is. There's certain sort of foundational stuff that every medical doctor has had. Mm -hmm. And then you take courses while you're in seminary that would kind of focus you in a direction. So for instance, at, at Duke, um, I had courses in, I had basic things like church history and the you know church uh, theology and Christian ethics and American Christianity. Those are kind of broad general courses. But then I also had courses on Methodist polity, Methodist doctrine, Methodist worship, and the and the other students, uh, like uh, the my Episcopal and Lutheran friends, they would oftentimes go do their Duke degree and then have to go do a year in an Episcopal or Lutheran seminary to get that specialized stuff. Okay. So um, uh, there is a little bit of both. Yeah. So where I went, Candler, they had a house of Episcopal studies. Mm -hmm. So they had a priest come and teach those courses that David's referring to and they had one for Baptist as well yeah I mean it's interesting because there are some definitely different beliefs and so like I guess there's some over overlapping that is consistent in the same kind of like with medical school but then you start getting into different different areas of different beliefs and so not one covers all Really? Yeah. But I think, you know, and we see this a lot of times in hymnody as well, because I, we draw on a lot of, in our hymnal, there are lots of different um, Catholic, 
hymns. Sorry, people are yelling outside my door. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Methodism is sacramental and evangelical. So somebody on Sunday said, I like those good Baptist hymns. Well, one of them was actually Methodist. I think there's this belief, like, if it's kind of fun to sing, it's got to be Baptist. Um, but there are a lot of, you know, great is thy faithfulness. That's a Methodist pastor wrote that. But we see that in the hymns, in the hymnody, that um, we have a broad tradition. But like David said, if you read Charles Wesley, that's very Wesley and very Methodist. Mm -hmm. uh, we just draw on other things. And I think that's the way MDivs work, too. You're, you're getting a broad base, but then a specific focus. Well, I think, you know, Kevin, you kind of named the uh, evangelical side of Methodism and the, in the best sense of that word, you know, the mm -hmm. church has good news to share. Um, read, read a hymn like um, Charles Wesley's Come Sinners to the Gospel Feast. And you would swear you were reading a Roman Catholic, you know, statement about um, Holy Communion. Um, I mean, it talks about eat, we eat his flesh and drink his blood. And it is pretty Catholic. Um, but and that's a place so that we, we would have a, a kind of a difference of opinion, say, from our Presbyterian and Baptist friends. And sometimes it's not so much a difference of um, uh, we believe this and they believe that. Quite often, it's a it's a difference of where the emphasis is placed, um, and um, so for for Methodists, you know, for instance, our sacramental theology is that God really does something when someone is baptized. It's not just it's not only my confession of faith; it's that something changes. It, it, it there it, grace is conveyed through the act of baptism, and the same same way through um, Holy Communion. That it is, it's not simply a, a remembering of what Christ is, has done. It's an actual participation in what right. Christ has done. It's not a re-sacrifice. Christ has sacrificed once, but but it is a participation. Somehow we get caught up in what God is doing um, mm -hmm. when we when we come to the Lord's table. Grace is conveyed and given. Right, we, like we in the really Baptist church. Want... Yeah, Baptist church, the, the communion is an ordinance, not a sacrament. Right. Yeah. And, uh, so in the one one difference would be in the Baptist church, there's more emphasis placed on what the individual believer is doing in the sacrament or the ordinance. Um, you know, my, I'm making a profession of faith and being baptized. I'm remembering Christ's sacrifice and receiving communion. In in the Methodist tradition, more Catholic traditions, the emphasis is more on what God is doing. Hmm. Which is why we baptize infants. Right. Right. Because we well, realize as adults, we don't really understand what's going on in baptism, too. So right. God's the primary actor, the, the agent. Sorry, Karen, go ahead. Well, and isn't there some one of the religions that won't recognize like our baptisms because we just sprinkle the water versus being dunked? Like, isn't somebody like they, they, they won't count it if you're baptized as a baby or something like that? I thought I've heard that one, too. Yeah. A lot of Baptist churches won't recognize Methodist baptism. They don't. They don't recognize any any infant baptisms for the most part. So if you if you were baptized as an infant in another tradition and you decide to join a Baptist church, more likely than not, they're going to ask you to be rebaptized, re baptized again. Mm -hmm. And and the Catholic Church is that way too, by the way. Well, I kind of figured. That, I mean, the Catholics are like they're in their own. Like you can't take communion. Like the, oh. you, I mean, they're very rigid, or not rigid, but just their community is very tight with what they allow. They'll recognize baptisms for the most part. Oh, they will. Mm -hmm. it, there may be some that they won't, but they will recognize Methodist baptisms if you want to become Roman Catholic and you were baptized as an infant as a United Methodist um, or as an Episcopalian. Or... Will they still allow? Um, couples who are different religions to marry like doesn't didn't, mm -hmm. was it, didn't they have to convert like or they had to go through classes or something like it, if you it, were it, it somewhat varies priest to priest or bishop to bishop how they interpret that but but I did a wedding once for a Methodist friend and his um, Catholic um, fiance and um, um, I co-presided with a Catholic bishop oh um, we did not have, it was not a full mass, however. Okay. It was simply the the vows and the pronouncement of marriage. And, hmm. Yep, I've done uh, that too. Here. Yeah. That's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, I wish there was kind of like, I mean, and I, and I think it's maybe not a big deal because people just kind of just always stick with the religion that they're in, but like if there was like a cheat sheet as far as what every single one believed in, and it was funny. So I was, you know, Googling and searching all these different things and there's a bunch of quizzes you can take online that tells you what religion you are. <laughs> None of them were like, I mean, but it was really, I think I took two or three of them just to see. Um, and the questions were so, so funny and so random and so different. And none of them like came back and said, oh, you're a hundred percent Methodist. Like it wasn't even like that at all. One of them didn't even use religion and they just renamed everything. Like if you attend church a lot, you're, you're this, or if you believe in this, you're like, they renamed everything. So, um, but it is interesting. And I think it's also, it's, it's kind of overwhelming, you know, if, if you are looking for a religion or if you're looking for a church and I think you just kind of end up where you're supposed to be. Don't you think you just kind of, it's a personal journey. And yeah, I, I think know. a lot of folks, um, they, they, they become a part of a church because they like the community yeah. that they encounter there or the experience, the worship service. Um, and used to folks would, you know, if you were, you know, 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, if you were United Methodist, you found the closest Methodist church when you moved to town and that's where you went. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that's much less common anymore. But folks are more about, I think, uh, and maybe this is healthy. Um, you know, finding the, a place that seems faithful and that they're connected with and um, the tradition. But it is, I mean, to your point, Karen, it is important to know what the church you are a part of actually teaches and believes yeah. so that you make sure that it resonates with who you are and, um, and that you haven't joined a cult or something yeah. crazy. <laughs> um, <laughs> So belief matters because belief uh, does shape our practice and how we treat others. And yeah, so. yeah. Well, very good. Um, is would you recommend any books or anything for anybody who wanted to learn more about different religions or more about Methodism? Was there one good one that you can recall? I know you've got your your reference books right behind you there, but are there any other books? Yeah. So. Um, uh, you know, Will Willimon has a little book called Why I Am United Methodist, uh, which is kind of, I think that's, uh, and he may have one called Basic Methodist Beliefs, too. I can't remember the exact title, but both are very accessible. They're short, you know, 70 to 100 pages. Kevin had a good one um, earlier. Kevin, what did you? Um, oh, it was by Andy uh, and our former senior pastor, Sally Langford. Uh -huh. Living, I think it's Living as United Methodist, I think it's what it's called. Um, and, and then uh, there's one for one. like, What's that? Belton Joyner's book too. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, being Methodist in the Bible Belt, which speaks to more kind of in our culture, being in the Southeast. Um, and that's more accessible for like teenagers. There are some lighthearted jokes and comics and stuff. So that, you know, I read it and I found it funny and entertaining, but um, it's not quite as serious. And both of those are very short, the Langford's and then Belton Joyner's book. Yeah. In fact, I have them in my office. If you want it, come by and I'll give it to you. Well, and the hymnal, um, the United Methodist hymnal, not that I suggest you read the entire hymnal, but if you notice at the top, don't do this when, like, you do this when I'm preaching. Don't do it when Kevin and them are singing. But um, um, at the top of the page, the it, the hymnal is broken out into, well, into many different categories, but the, the Wesley's categories are under ways of understanding grace. So there's provenient grace, justifying grace, sanctifying grace, and hymns related to that theme. And so you can learn a lot just by looking at those sections and say, what, did, what do we believe about prevenient grace? Well, find a hymn and read it. Um, not all hymns are created equal, but if it's a Charles Wesley hymn, even if it's not singable, and some of them aren't, nope. um, uh, the, the text will be, the theology will be sound. So. Okay. Um, as far as church announcements, coming up. So we have heard from um, Charlotte Water, City Water, that um, if you've been around in the area, you can tell that they've been working on this water project for a while. And apparently they are due to work in front of our church, not this Sunday, but the following Sunday, the 18th. 
Um, we are waiting to confirm to make sure that it's actually going to happen that weekend because we know how utility companies work. Um, we will have information, information that we will send out um, via email that will also kind of detail the road closures because Main Street will be closed in front of our church and you will be detoured. Some longer detours than others. Um, I think when Keith and I were talking, they have the detour starting all the way down at Antiquity. Like if you're heading north on Main Street, you won't be able to go past Antiquity, which is crazy that it's so far. But we're working on that. I know Keith is trying to make some arrangements with them to see if we can get everybody there. But we are open on Sunday the 18th. It may take you longer to get there. Um, it will be going on, I think, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So it won't just be on Sunday either if you're headed to Davidson or in the area on Friday. Um, but we will send out more information when we know specifically more details. Um, there is also, we still have the grief, um, the grief series study that starts tomorrow. I think they still have some spots available. If you're interested in that, you can sign up on the website under registration. And we need all of your prayers because Kevin and I and 33 other adults and children and youth are headed to, um, our choir trip. Kevin, you want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, we're going to Pigeon Forge for a week, uh, starting in Knoxville. And per our conversation today, we're actually singing a Catholic Mass on Saturday night. We're singing at an Episcopal, two services in an Episcopal Cathedral on Sunday morning, and then back to the Catholic Church to do a concert. And then on Tuesday, we're singing uh, an evening prayer service at a campground that's a uh, Smoky Mountain campground. So this is a deferred trip from last year. We should have gone to Atlanta. That got canceled. So we rented a big giant cabin and then that got canceled. And then we were just going to stay here and then that got canceled. So <laughs> really excited for these youth to have a chance to go uh, and sing. They've been great all year long, being flexible. And uh, yes, yeah, so we have a lot of adults. That's really good. We're going to stay in a giant cabin that sleeps, I think, 60, but we're only going to take mid 30s. Um, so please yeah. pray for us. Yes. <laughs> it's going to be great. Oh, no, I love them. They're great. They're great trips. We just haven't done a cabin like this in a while. And uh, it's a different trip because the adults are right there with them, not in the hotel rooms where we tape them in and walk away. This is <laughs> convincing these teenagers to go to sleep will be fun. Hey, that's Methodism uh, in a nutshell from camp, from camp meeting. That's right. Singing to uh, Catholic mass. There you go. <laughs> Doing it all yeah. and eating. We're going to be eating a lot. Well, that's the perfect Methodist trip. Yeah. Eating and singing. <laughs> the two things we do best. Yeah. yeah. All three of my children are actually, so my husband will have a wonderful week because he'll be home alone and um, the rest <laughs> of us are going, but my three are really looking forward to it. And, and Kevin, you had touched on this before too, but this year, I mean, I think all of them are just looking forward to having time together and being together and um, just catching up on what they've missed for the last 18 months, you know? It's been so. remarkable. They used to just like breeze in and breeze out in rehearsals, but they show up early and hang out and then sit in the parking lot afterwards and talk. And it's been really encouraging to watch. Yeah. So, so that will be great. So be thinking of us next week. I'm sure usually around Wednesday is when everybody hits a wall and yep. everyone's ready to get home. Yep. <laughs> we come home Friday just in time for the road closure. So who knows how we'll get back in, but we'll figure it out. I'll walk, whatever. <laughs> At that point, yes. <laughs> uh, but we'll be back um, with our show in, in two weeks. So everybody have a great day. Enjoy your, your summer and we'll be back soon. Take care. Uh, Have you done still... those retreats where you can't talk? Like, oh, yes. Like a... I've, I've, I've never done, done week-long silent retreats. Kevin, I could never see you, ever. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah. I, the thing, like, I would be okay with not talking, like, because I'm an introvert, but, like, not being able to make jokes, that would be hard for me. <laughs> well, you save them up till the end of the week. I guess I could. Hey, remember four days ago when... Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>